So thank you very much for having me here today, as well as Morgan and Savannah, to talk about Mapping Stories of the City, a class I taught last semester. Um, the class, well, I'll tell a little bit about what I'm going to talk about and then what Morgan and Savannah will cover. I'll speak to the interdisciplinary approach as to why I combine storytelling with mapping. And then Morgan and Savannah will talk about the um, the website content they created as part of the final product of Mapping Stories of the City. Um, so a little background to Mapping Stories of the City. This is the website. So the class was a study of four cities, Boston, Chicago, LA, and Somerville, post-1950s to the present. We looked at major urban changes in that time, and a huge part of the class was about thinking uh, about the changes happening in Somerville today. As some of you may know, Somerville is undergoing significant urban development changes with relation to transit and uh, commercial revitalization. We're expecting, hopefully, um, but we're unsure with the Green Line budget, uh, the MBTA budget, there may be about five stations that will be coming to Somerville. One of them is planned for Tufts, right? Uh, university. There's also a revitalization of the historic commercial center in Somerville, Union Square, um, and that process is also accelerating gentrification in the city. Um, and in addition to those big processes around land development and transit, there's also a revitalization of green space happening, um, with the city more focused on making it more accessible and better, as well as nonprofits like the Mystic River Watershed Association. So. Um, the community engagement aspect was really important. They started from the beginning of the semester to the end. And as a part of it, they worked with community nonprofits as well as um, City of Somerville departments to learn more about the changes taking place. Um, and their end product was to create a website that would hopefully help both residents and maybe the city um, engage with more residents in terms of the, the com complexity of changes taking place. So uh, here's some of the content from the website. The students created route maps using Google My Maps. So favorite routes or routes that would be really fun to travel from um, different destinations to the Mystic. Development maps using Google My Maps. This is really important. It happened during um, a really powerful time when a new development plan was emerging around Union Square. This allowed residents and community organizations to really visualize uh, the size of the change that's about to take place in Union Square. Um, there were also demographic maps using Social Explorer, which is a mapping tool that uses census legacy data to show patterns and trends of changes within uh, demographic categories. Um, in addition to that, the students are asked to really place themselves in different um, locations in Somerville and think about transit in the different locations they chose. So Morgan worked on the community path. Savannah looked at Ward 7 in Clarendon Hills. Other people uh, looked at Union Square. So there are some really great short transit videos thinking about what transit is looking like right now in the midst, in the midst of this change. Um, they also interviewed community members. Lucy Nunn is a board member of the Growing Center in Somerville. And you can listen to her interview with Savannah, and Savannah will talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then finally, they did blog posts about what the changes were about, right, as an entry and introduction to general audience. So one of the blog posts is, what is transit-oriented development? Okay, so in thinking about why this intersection between storytelling and visual mapping tools, um, it, it's a really interesting question, because storytelling is uh, has a long and important history within organizing, but why also uh, visual mapping tools? And what relation does it have to urban environmental justice? Will be the central question I'll pursue for the rest of the presentation. So um, for environmental justice, I thought it'd be really good just to think about how I have approached it or think about it. So from uh, Julian Adjuman, Just Sustainability, he talks about co-production, right, where people are understood as assets rather than burdens. And this um, is usually in the context of communities, right, that people are not simply residents. They are also active and able to participate, engage, and be uh, designers, creators, and producers. 
of their social well-being and more increasingly um, their economic well-being. Um, finally, it also engages in this co-production model, engages with peer support networks and professionals to build skills and access to resources. So in sum, right, it's an active process that encourages community members to come together, identify shared values and interests in order to shape an environment. Um, essentially, really deeply engaged uh, work with the place that you live in, um, in addition to creating greater connections with the people who are living in the area. So storytelling, as you can imagine, is really fundamental to thinking about creating those connections, right, the shared values. It becomes sort of the foundation for it. So it really provides for the storyteller agency and self-empowerment in many cases, as well as greater self-awareness about one's history, right? When you start talking about your own experiences, it gives you a greater sense of what, um, what, what, what part of the, the community you might fit into. Listeners also gain deeper connections to abstract concepts, social policies, or numbers. When you hear about other people's stories, uh, you see them more as people and not just simply as neighbors or people who live in Somerville. They have a, a, you have a deeper connection, right? And finally, it builds new connections and strengthens old ones. So there's a lot of storytelling in current day environmental justice projects. Sorry, it's a little blurry, but the first one at the top is um, it's very much integrated within housing, affordable housing advocacy work. As you can see in the middle, um, the EPA is also included in its blog, right, storytelling to confront um, injustice in exploitative labor conditions in farms in the U.S. And then finally, much closer to home, um, Professor Adjuman has started this project called the Urban Food Stories, telling our stories for food justice. So storytelling is really fundamental to thinking about environmental justice and social change. Um, at the same time, storytelling is just one tool within environmental justice teaching. Um, and I emphasize that because that's where the mapping comes in, but also um, it's a little too much to depend on storytelling as the tool for social change. Um, and this is in part because of practical limitations. There may be competing sympathies and limited resources. So currently, one might say, I believe in affordable housing. People should all be able to find a place to live. But at the same time, I also want economic revitalization. And they feel like it could be a zero-sum game, right, where if we want to revitalize the center, then a certain number of people have to be displaced, right? So storytelling gets you to the place of thinking about these emotional issues, but doesn't quite lead you to any specific social action. Um, when we think about it within an environmental justice framework. There are also connections that may be made specific to the space and time of the interaction only, where um, the bonds created aren't necessarily something that go beyond the experience. And again, in and of itself, it's not a terrible thing, but within an environmental justice framework, there's no necessary clear social action that can emerge, right? Because storytelling in itself is very complex. There are many ways to understand a person's story. And then on the, other, on the flip side of it, if you do find that a person's story can have a very singular message or a clear message, there are also some moral risks. There's effective appropriation, where if you've never experienced another person's um, experiences, uh, where do you blur the line if you end up feeling like you totally understand what the other person is going through by sort of um, understanding too much, empathizing too much. Or there's an oversimplification of a story in a single dimension, right? That, that one person just represents, if it's affordable housing issues, affordable housing, the challenge of affordable housing. So storytelling and mapping tools are really crucial, I'm going to say, um, because it raises a lot of important questions. It really brings each participant sort of equally to the foreground, right? How you move through space is something everyone does, right? But your interests, your history within that is something worth examining. So I feel like mapping becomes sort of a neutral um, uh, medium for sharing with each participant, allowing each person's experience and knowledge 
to be valued and, and maybe even rethought, right? And it's very hands-on and investigative. And in that hands-on approach, I feel like it also allows you to come up with really creative and innovative solutions that rethink um, really important things, including boundaries, right? So when students are doing Google Mind Maps, something that really allows you to see the pattern of streets, the storefronts, um, within a larger scale, it really forces you to think about why you travel, the certain routes that you travel, what routes you think are safe, are they the same routes that other people would think are safe? These are really useful questions to think about um, in mapping. And then in Social Explorer, uh, the demographic tool, you can start to see patterns and changes that happen over time and think about why, right? And ask really important questions as to how those patterns came about, right, versus being things that were natural or um, something that people didn't also influence, right? So it raises really important questions in the process of mapping. Um, so finally, I just want to give my acknowledgement to our course, sponsor, uh, course sponsors, the Environmental Studies Program, Tustin Clue of Environment, the Tisch College of Public Service and Citizenship really made the class possible, so deeply grateful for you. Um, community partners from both the city and um, the nonprofit side, Somerville Community Corporation, Mystic River Watershed Association, the City of Somerville Historic Preservation Commission, City of Somerville Strategic Planning and Community Development, Friends of the Community Path, Groundwork Somerville, and the Growing Center were really crucial to making this a successful course. I mean, their willingness to help with their time, efforts, and knowledge uh, were really at the core of the course, even though I didn't have time to talk about it. I can talk more about that at the Q&A if you're interested. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over to Morgan. Um, so hello, everyone. Is my mic good? OK. Um, so my name is Morgan. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Tufts. I'm majoring in anthropology with a minor in urban studies. Um, and when I saw that Mapping Stories of the City was offered in the Environmental Studies uh, Department, I was so happy because um, urban studies um, and ideas of mapping and map mapping practices are something, uh, things that I've always been really, really interested in. Um, so I actually, uh, Lai Yang actually gave us the opportunity to explore different points of transit um, in Somerville. And um, as she mentioned, I focused on the community path. Is there any way that we can get to the website from the... Perfect. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so my focus was, um, as I said, on the community path. And what I was really looking at, um, at least initially, was the benefits of multimodal transit um, in a space like Somerville. Um, and in terms of transportation, a mode um, is simply a, t a different type of transit. So multimodal transportation simply means a transportation system that incorporates many different types of transit. So that could be um, cars and bikes and pedestrian paths and things like that, public transportation. Um, and multimodal uh, systems of transportation are very important um, for spaces, for urban spaces in particular, because they reduce our dependence on cars. Um, that reduces our environmental impact and is also key for transportation access and equity um, because it reduces our uh, need for cars, thus um, providing transit opportunities for people who can't drive or who won't drive. Um, and this is incredibly important for Somerville itself because uh, Somerville has a great number of residents who commute to work um, in modes of transportation other than cars. So that would be walking or biking or taking public transportation. And um, indeed, one of the biggest spaces of multimodal transit in Somerville is the Somerville Community Path. Um, and so just a little bit of history on the Community Path. Is that pretty good? 
map right there. Um, so the Somerville Community Path was, uh, the first part of the Somerville Community Path was built in the mid-1980s. This is when the red line extended up from Harvard uh, through Davis Square to Alewife. Um, and at the time it was decided that um, a pedestrian path would be built above sort of the subway tunnel going from Davis Square to Alewife so people could walk between the stations. And that was the um, bit of the, the path that was in Somerville itself was called the Somerville Community Path. Um, then in the mid-1990s, the path was extended uh, eastward um, along the abandoned right-of-way of the Massachusetts Central Railroad to Cedar Street. Um, and then in the early 2000s, um, the state of Massachusetts approved the Green Line extension um, that would go essentially from its current terminus at Leechmere through Somerville and eventually to West Medford, West Medford along existing commuter rail tracks. Um, and uh, at the same time, it approved an extension of the community path that would run essentially parallel to the tracks um, from its terminus at Cedar Street all the way to Leechmere. Um, but as we know, the Green Line is not being built right now. It's stalled due to bu budgetary issues, budget issues. Um, and the community path has stalled as well. And I was actually talking to Lynn Weissman, who is the co-founder um, and president of the community organization Friends of the Community Path. Um, and she told me that the reason why the community path has actually stalled, construction on the community path expansion has stalled, is because um, the same technology essentially would be used to build both uh, the Green Line tract and the path itself. So it would be cost prohibitive right now to build the community path without the green line, and so that's why they've both stalled. Um, so the future of the community path right now is a little bit uncertain. However, an expansion of the path was constructed to Lowell Street, and that opened in 2015. So the current path essentially goes, uh, in Somerville, goes from the Somerville-Cambridge border uh, over to Lowell Street, and then stops. Um, so what are some of the benefits of the community path? Well, a huge, huge, huge benefit is that it provides car independent access to the Davis Square and Alewife key stops, and this is um, really, really important. Um, it also provides uh, pedestrian access to the neighborhoods in between the key stops, um, and if the extension is completed, it'll provide pedestrian access uh, between or pedest a pedestrian link between uh, the red and green lines. And this is huge because uh, within the uh, one and a half mile of the completed path and its projected uh, expansion, there are 89,000 uh, Massachusetts residents. And of those 89,000 residents, about 24% of them do not have access to a car. So access to an alternative mode of transportation, this multimodal transportation system, is key for transit access and equity uh, for many of the area's residents. Um, also, the Somerville, Somerville Community Path is a huge swath of green space uh, within Somerville. As we know, Somerville is very, very urban, very um, densely populated. There's not an enormous amount of green space in the city. Um, and so the importance of the Somerville Community Path as a space where residents can come, uh, congregate, uh, uh, engage in recreational activities, that sort of thing is paramount. In fact, um, a survey was conducted in 2008 uh, of Somerville residents, and it found that the uh, area of the path between um, uh, the Somerville Cambridge border and uh, Cedar Street was the most popular recreational space in the city. Um, so the community path existence as green space in the city is very important. Savannah is actually going to talk a little bit more about green space um, in just a minute. Um, and then in terms of the extension of the community path, um, one of the main things that it would do is connect um, actually to uh, commuter paths or bikeway to existing commuter paths and bikeways um, in the greater uh, Boston area. Those are the Minuteman Commuter Bikeway, uh, which stretches from Cambridge through Arlington uh, to Lexington and Bedford, um, to the um, Charles River Path, which links essentially Boston and Cambridge and Watertown and Newton and Waltham. Um, so this would provide, I think, about 33 miles of um, car-independent multimodal um, transit pathways that would extend um, the area in which residents are able to travel the area to which students are, uh, residents are able to travel uh, without cars, um, which is important. And then also the extension of the community path, as I said, would run parallel to the green line. So essentially this means um, that it would provide multimodal ADA compliant access to um, the green line stations itself, ho hopefully boosting its ridership. Um, and at the same time would provide um, a maintenance corridor for the green line and also uh, uh, an area of emergency egress. 
uh, from the Green Line if it ever broke down. So I would argue, based on my research, I would argue that the extension of the community path is very, very important um, to not only to the Green Line, but also for Somerville's residents um, in general, because it provides that multimodal uh, car-free uh, linkage between different transit points in the area. Um, so that was kind of something that I got from doing a lot of research, from kind of looking at demographic data, looking at um, uh, sort of sources and things like that, things that people had published. But I also um, spent a lot of time on the community path itself, sort of just walking around it, interacting with the residents, uh, talking to people I saw, kind of getting a feel for the space. Um, and I came to find something really, really interesting, which is that the Somerville community path um, is a space that has been um, very much shaped by the people who walk on it, by the community itself. And I actually made a video um, about that, which I would like to show to you. Uh, and uh, this, I believe this video will be available as a link um, in the uh, description. Right, and remote people won't be able to hear it. Yeah, but, yes. Oh, there's no sound. Okay. It's fine. I can just talk about it. Yeah, you, you might have to. No, it should be on. We tested it earlier. I can just talk about it. It's fine. So um, essentially, what I noticed when I was walking is there are a lot of art installations along the borders of the path. Um, I saw a bunch of mixed media statues. I saw um, paintings on canvases propped up against trees. Um, I saw a map of Somerville painted onto the wall of a building. Um, a lot of um, art installations like this. And I was actually talking to Lynn Weissman, and she said that these art installations were not officially sanctioned by the city of Somerville. They were just kind of spontaneously created um, art that was placed there by the community. Um, and I think this is really important because it shows that the community is using the space um, as its own. Um, another thing that I saw at the same time uh, were gardens. Um, there are a bunch of little like pop-up gardens there. There's a bunch of there's a, one officially sanctioned garden, but there's also a bunch of uh, pop-up small gardens there. And I was actually talking to um, a resident that I met while I was walking at one point, and, and she was tending to one of these small pop-up gardens. And I asked her, you know, why are these here? Like, how did these how did these come to be? And she said. Um, her and a couple other people actually started these gardens um, on the land by the path. Um, and she said that she has never been contacted by the city of Somerville, um, by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, who officially owns the land, to remove these gardens. Um, so the city, the government, is kind of allowing them to stay. Um, and they're kind of expressions, uh, they're t tended by the residents themselves, so they're kind of expressions um, of what the residents want to see, ha uh, see uh, appear in the space. Um, this is an example of an officially sanctioned community garden. It's right next to the path. Um, and we'll see, like these are pictures of sort of the more spontaneous pop-up garden. Um, and uh, another thing that the, that the person I was talking to told me is she always tries to label her plants um, sort of with their scientific names. And she's actually seen people who are walking by in the path stop and examine the names and kind of talk about the plants and kind of engage in this dialogue, um, which kind of builds, I, I think, builds kind of this, this idea of community in the space. Um, and so I would argue that in my research, um, it was really important to sort of learn the statistics, learn the facts, do a bunch of, of academic and scholarly research, but it was also equally important for me to go out um, and actually explore the community path and the space itself, um, because through sort of negotiating the space, I was able to kind of gain more insight into what the path means for its residents. Um, so this way I was kind of able to build um, more upon the narrative of, of what the community path means and its importance. And I would argue in the end, uh, the community path is important not just because um, it is a space of multimodal transit in the area, um, but also because it is a platform uh, for community expression. Um, at the same time, I recognize it's important to ask um, who is, it, like who, what members of the community are expressing themselves um, on the path, uh, who is able to do that, who is not. These are um, 
conversations that I think, or questions that I think need to be asked, um, something that I would like to explore a little bit more in the future with the community path. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um, okay, so hi everyone, I'm Savannah. I am a senior and I am an English and Environmental Studies major. So similar to Lai Ying, I have a very sort of interdisciplinary approach to Environmental Studies and I've always been interested in this intersection between humanities and um, sort of environmental storytelling. So what I focus on for my project, as has been said, is green and open space in Somerville. Um, let me close up. And green open space in Somerville is extremely important as, as we all know, a very dense city. Um, green open space only makes up 6.75% of the total land use. So um, it's definitely very minimal and important to the community. Um, and part of the importance is that green space has always traditionally been thought of as sort of protected parks and not like nature conservancies and things of that nature. But there's been a recent shift in um, past years to sort of broaden this definition of open space to include um, other areas. And so Somerville now defines open space as publicly owned, undeveloped land that is primarily vegetated, but also paved areas that serve a recreational or cultural purpose. So as Morgan discussed, um, the pathway is not only just for um, open areas or sort of protected areas, it's also for transit, for recreational use. Um, so it is including parks, playgrounds, community gardens, walking, bike trails, cemeteries, civic plazas, and playing fields. And um, this is also important for promoting not just the ecological health of a community by preserving natural resources, but it's also important for preserving public health. And public health relies on these places for recreation and exercise. Um, we also read an article in the class that there's this growing consensus among cognitive scientists that proximity to these kinds of areas does correlate with improved community mental health. Um, so to explore this a little further, I interviewed Lucy Nunn at the Growing Center. And Lucy Nunn's a board member at the Somerville Community Growing Center. It's um, a public garden that was founded in 1984 as an educational space. There we go. And it's a public garden which people can buy into plots of land. Here's a couple pictures. And they can use these plots of land to grow vegetables, grow food. Um, it's also a place where people screen movies during the summer. And Lucy was talking a lot about how she, she and the other board members, their goal for this space is really to make it a community effort and making it open to the public and open for everyone, adults and children alike. Um, and in 2012, they received uh, funding from the state to be paired with a couple of different groups, one called Terra Cura Inc. and one called Community Outreach. So not only is TerraCure Inc. helping them with sort of their infrastructure and their retaining wall and their labyrinth of the garden. Um, let me see that the picture of that. But also uh, how to sort of create a sustainable funding model to incorporate the community interest in the best way possible. This is actually a good picture. This is the children's garden. And they have um, gardening days for kids and classes that people can take on the weekends. Um, and so this is a highly trafficked open space for Somerville, but not all of Somerville is this way. In fact, I, so what I was mainly focusing on in my project was this connection between the minimal open space that is available and environmental justice. And I started first by sort of by defining environmental justice for myself. And I looked a little bit at the history of the movement. It is a movement that began in the 1960s and 70s, and this was when working class communities and communities of color across the US were sort of calling for this recognition that um, negative environmental impacts were having a disproportionate effect on their communities than others. And it sort of culminated in the 1980s um, with Cesar Chavez's organized call for occupational health and safety rights of immigrant farm workers in California, and also with the placement of a toxic waste site in Warren County, North Carolina. And um, Warren County is a predominantly African-American community, and they worked in partnership with the United Church of Christ to um, rally against the placement of this toxic landfill in their community. 
and they were the first to cite this as an issue in civil rights and were the first to use the term environmental racism. And sort of since then, many studies have noted this similar phenomenon in which environmental burdens are placed disproportionately in communities of color and working class communities. Um, it was in 2002 that two professors at Northeastern found a similar phenomenon in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, let me actually pull this up. And these two professors also found that different environmental burdens such as um, hazardous waste sites, absence of food sources, uh, were concentrated in those, in those communities. So to situate that movement, I looked at it in Somerville specifically. And this is a picture from the GIS um, data given by the state. And the state itself defines environmental justice community based on three criteria, which is what this map is made of. Um, they define it as if a community is 25% or more <laughs> minority, um, if the community is uh, below the median household income, um, or rather, if 65%, I'm so sorry, um, they selected black groups with a median household income less than 65% of the state median income value, and if the community was linguistically isolated. And sort of based on these criteria, they defined communities that may be more susceptible to environmental injustice. And as you can see from this map, the, those communities are defined on the west and east ends of Somerville. So here in East Somerville and here in West Somerville. And it's interesting because uh, there's sort of this concentration of environmental justice communities in East Somerville. And the Boston Metropolitan Planning Organization um, has deemed this area of particular environmental justice concern because it does contain the largest proportion of low income and immigrant residents. and also has the highest burden of transportation infrastructure because this community in particular is bounded on both sides by McGrath Highway and I-93, which sort of cuts off the community from other green and, open, green and open spaces and also from the Mystic River. So this may cause negative health effects in the community for a variety of reasons. Um, and one of the things that we did with the class is we took a tour of East Somerville um, with the Somerville Community Corporation, and what something that they talk a lot about is providing affordable housing in these kinds of areas if you are going to, um, in these areas such as East Somerville, if you are going to increase the Green Line extension into these areas, how do you secure communities that they're not displaced? Um, so I will now show a video. So my partner and I, we um, were looking at sort of the environmental justice communities in Somerville and found well, something that was really interesting was on that western end of Somerville, that environmental justice community stood out from the surrounding areas. Because we traditionally think of West Somerville as sort of the higher income area of the city. So it's interesting that in this particular pocket, there was this community that was defined by the state as an environmental justice community. Um, so we took a look at the Clandon Hill Busway, which is at the center of that community, and started to kind of look outward at what might be causing that. Wait, there's... The Clarendon Hill Busway connects residents of Somerville's Ward 7 and also those of neighboring Arlington to multiple bus lines. The bus stop includes a couple waiting shelters which face a large and gravel lot. Used frequently by many members of the surrounding area, the busway serves a large set of four riders. And while this space serves the community as a critical transportation hub, it lacks connectivity to green spaces despite close proximity to them, meaning there's a lack of signage guiding four riders to the river and a lack of knowledge about the river's location across from the stop and shop. This convergent transit space borders the Mystic River along this stretch of neighboring Arlington and the Green Space along it, including the Alewife Greenway Path and the Veterans Cemetery Park. The river was once vital to the operations of a variety of businesses in the 19th century, including farming, shipbuilding, distilleries, and tie mills. Today, the river offers a more tranquil 
landscape for the urban transportation hub on which it sits, and the creation of green space around the river enables to bring people into closer contact with the natural resources. So why would a lack of connection to this critical green space be of particular importance to a community so close to natural places? Green space is of particular importance to Somerville's Ward 7, as it has been designated an environmental justice community by the city of Somerville. This means that the area meets the four Massachusetts environmental justice criteria established by the state in 2002. One, more than 25% of residents are low income. Two, at least one quarter are born poor. Three, the demographics reflect more than 25% non-white of people of color population. And four, at least a quarter linguistically isolated. These categories aim to capture the degree of sensibility of the particular community to environmental justice burdens, such as proximity to hazardous toxins air pollution and food desert. In the case of Ward 7, residents may likely experience negative health effects from poor air quality and proximity to two major roads, Route 16 and Broadway. Access to green space may help to alleviate some of these environmental burdens and increase health. To increase access to green space and alleviate the pressure of environmental injustice, we envision a busway that borders a field and not a gravel lot, with an inviting space for bus drivers to rest. Clear signs directing poor riders and other bus users to the greenway and surrounding open spaces are needed to connect the local population to spaces that increase quality of life. And perhaps this important transportation hub will spur residents to reimagine the way they see the space, making it more of a destination. All right, so thank you for bearing with me on the delayed audio. Um, but what my partner and I found that was so interesting was that it wasn't really a lack of access to green space that was maybe causing the state to classify this area as environmental justice. It was more sort of the way the infrastructure was built um, around this transportation hub. And even though this area was sort of bounded on two major, by two major roadways, it was still close to the river and close to the Alewife Brook Parkway mainly just a lack of signage wasn't directing people to those areas. Um, and the other thing to note about this area is that it houses the Clarendon Hill Towers, which is one of the few affordable housing communities in Somerville. And if you've ever been in that area, it's across from the Stop and Shop, the huge towers over there. They are, they are a tenant-owned building, and this was due to the successful formation of a nonprofit corporation by the renters themselves in 1989. So the renters themselves own the building, um, but they are facing the risk of being displaced by gentrification, because this is also another area in which the Green Line might be extended. Um, so even though these people make up the core ridership of the area, if they are displaced and replaced by car owners, this could sort of cause or a worsening of the environmental justice risk. Um, and that is all I have. Thank you. Um, Ali and um, Savannah also created a Google My Maps uh, routes to the Mystic to encourage people to see the proximity with which we live near green spaces like the Mystic. Um, and also Morgan created a really wonderful um, demographic map in Social Explorer. So they did a lot of work and they um, gave a great preview of some of the stuff. Any questions? <coughs> I'm curious to hear more about the stories that you heard as you were talking to people because I, I was really sort of captivated by this notion that you can learn about a space through talking to people, maybe even a common space or along the bike path. I, I, was, I heard a little bit from Morgan about this, but I was, I was, Savannah, I was kind of curious about the role of storytelling in sort of what you learned. Um, I think the biggest sort of element for storytelling was when I interviewed Lucy Nunn at the Growing Center. And she, as a board member of the Growing Center, she was also very involved in the Union Square redevelopment. So she emphasized, because she was sort of involved in this area that was taking in feedback from many members of the community, she would attend these meetings um, to sort of see what people were talking about and sort of how people were feeling about different infrastructural changes. 
So I think that was the biggest thing in that the, Gre the Growing Center kind of became representative of all those different converging stories. And yeah, I, it, she definitely tried to incorporate that in her work. And it's definitely a heated, at times, debate going on in that area of Somerville, but it was necessary to include all those voices. Um, professor, uh, my question is for you. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, Somerville is among the most den the densest communities in Massachusetts and is also quite transportation starved. And it also has um, poor air quality relative to the rest of the state. My question is, um, what are some specific policies that policymakers could enact to both ensure transportation justice, um, the uh, construction of new transportation lines to increase mobility for residents, but to at the same time prevent gentrification from overtaking the community? Yeah, I mean, I think what you just um, said sort of answers a huge part of that question about uh, reducing the air pollution burden on working class and communities of color that Savannah has um, spoken about so well. Um, the Green Line extension is definitely under threat. So greater support, um, written support or petitions, I'm sure, will help um, um, make the case that it's really important to have these multiple stations put in so that more people are able to travel non-vehicular, um, you know, uh, to travel to places that don't depend on the automobile. Um, in terms of the other kind of the question about displacement, there's a lot of work happening in Union Square itself, if you're interested. So um, there's a community group, uh, Union United, that's been uh, working to prevent displacement as more and more development happens. Um, around that center and some of the things that they're looking at are community land trusts um, as well as creating a community benefits agreement and um, I'm going to sort of pull out Kat here who's also a member of the class um, and she actually did do some work around Union Square and talking about community benefits agreement and you can also find some information on the website about what that could do to help prevent displacement. Um, so if Kat wants to add a few words she can or um, you can feel free to look it up here too. Thank you. Oh, yep. Uh, so Lisa Jordan has a uh, question. Uh, I'm going to unmute Lisa her. Jordan has a. Um, hello. Um, I enjoyed the talk very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wasn't able to access the, the website that you were showing. Is this public content, or are there plans to make some portion of it public? Yes, it's public. Um, I don't know if you were able to see the PowerPoint. Um, in the first few pages, it has the website at the top. Um, so it's site.tufts.edu backslash Somerville 2015 backslash. OK, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kyle Monhan. I'm in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. I'm a second year PhD. So I think um, I work on water sanitation and hygiene primarily. Uh, and I think that these issues of narratives and environmental justice are very important for our field, but are seldom used. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how can I take what I learned today from you guys and what you spoke about with Ward 7 and Somerville and apply it in a more generalizable context? Is, is there a way, what can I pull out of here and say, <laughs> to the people I work with and things like that and say, uh, this is what we need to do with narratives in our work. Yeah, um, I think um, I was just re-scanning some of the recent work that Professor Julian Adjunin has been doing, who's um, in the UEP program here at Tufts. And it does seem like he has a particular focus on storytelling. Um, he started the um, food um, uh, project, right, the storytelling project that you saw in one of the slides. Um, and he might have a, few, a little bit more information about how you might start it. Um, in terms of my own work, I think it's really important to build connections to community groups who are already involved in um, the issues that you're working around because usually they have a membership and those members might be people who might want to talk about those stories. And then from there you can branch out more and talk with um, who those members know who are deeply affected by the issues that you're looking at. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Far away, sorry, right. You used to be close. Okay, um, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. If you were to teach the class again, what would you do differently? Oh, or yeah, this, I mean, this is the, the first same? one, so there are probably Morgan and Savannah might have some suggestions as well as Kat. Um, yeah, it was, um, it was a blur a little bit because there were so many components um, because community uh, partners were present throughout from the beginning of the semester and it was even that was sort of difficult to juggle. So I feel like a second go would definitely be um, better organized. Well, it wasn't necessarily disorganized on my part. Like I didn't feel like it was disorganized, but um, it takes months of organization as well as just simply the act of building these relationships and continuing them with the organizations that really create a sort of easier flow, I feel, like versus a one-time uh, course teaching. So I feel like the next time there might be um, easier communication paths, right, to, to creating the um, connections between students and community. Um, oh, there's so many things I would do over again on small details. I don't know. Were you thinking of anything particularly that you thought? Um, yeah. I mean, I think the social explorer teaching could have been a little bit clearer from the beginning um, because there were so many tools and I wasn't used to teaching it um, that uh, going over it again would be really useful. And it's a great tool, actually as a demographic um, uh, visualization of patterns of change in the U.S. So, yeah. Well, Coco. Great presentation, really Thank inspiring. You. Can you tell us more about the tools you use to create the maps and are they accessible to anyone or are they easy to use? Can you tell more about yeah. that? Yeah, um, so they are really accessible. Um, in terms of the Google My Maps <laughs> that you see, you, um, if you have a Google account, um, a Gmail account, you can find on the upper right hand usually um, a menu where you can find My Maps and you can create your own maps. So that's actually starting to be really popular where people create their own routes and share it with friends and even the general public. And they are shareable with the public. Um, you just have to fiddle around with the settings. And then uh, we didn't quite get to look at the demographic maps and I think um, even though I didn't, you know, I, I definitely could have done a better job teaching it. Uh, class members did an amazing job creating some really wonderful demographic maps. So, um, for instance, Cats Union Square demographics, um, they looked at uh, specific categories um, for Cat and Claire, her partner, they looked at educational attainment, housing prices over 300 and 500,000, renter occupied housing, average gross rent and foreign born population to look at trends and whether or not um, we can see a rapid acceleration of gentrification in the last several years. Um, it takes a little while to upload, but Social Explorer um, is available to the public if it's publicly shared, but it does require uh, institutional subscription. So it's wonderful that Tufts has it. Yeah, and it's actually, the learning curve for this is wonderful if you guys are interested in mapping tools because um, it's much easier than ArcGIS and doesn't require a class, per se. Oh. Um, yeah, the Social Explorer allows one to create a storytelling feature. So this is sort of the beginning of it. Uh, and then we can flip through. Okay. And it's really great because they're interactive. So you can choose the category that you want to look at. Oops, wrong one. Uh, population, persons over 25 years and old, older from 1990. And then if you want to look at 2000, you can use the swipe feature to increase the map and see how it's changed in different parts. Um, it's really fun and it is really meant to be also a tool that community members might want to use to look at the changes in their community. Yeah, Kat, did you want to add anything? You're nodding. Maybe not. Um, yeah, I thought it was a good thing. Yeah, I thought it was a good thing. Show changes in the time. Yeah. Thank you. I thought it was a good way to show changes over time in a really visual way. Mm -hmm. um, and having it paired with the census tracts was good because you can really like pull out the different pieces um, and look at who's being affected where. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you.
And there's a lot of uh, different statistics that you can look at. That's right, that's right. I have a question regarding um, the stories that could potentially be used in the future. And it would seem logical that if you had uh, transportation lines that those might coincide with the lower cost housing. But um, it seems like there might be a number of things that could be done to improve the conditions, whether it be the structure of the building or something to do with the air pollution or noise or something. And so maybe from the stories that get told, you could get information from the residents in how they could improve the situation for, in these places. Because uh, there's many cities, including Medford, that you know, don't take advantage of being right on the river. If you look at the infrastructure of the past, and this is true in many other cities, um, which are now beginning to turn their buildings around to look and face these waterways that can be you know, accessed in good recreational areas. It was just an idea. In terms of the stories, if you, they may have already suggested things, but I don't know if anyone's looked at those. Yeah, um, part of it, there's so much um, community ferment right now in organizing and creating um, a greater awareness about the changes happening, that this is sort of one of the tools entering into that stream. So Union United has also created um, a uh, community tour that also invited uh, people to talk about their personal stories in Union Square. So um, we're hoping we're seeing this as one of the tools to try to broaden the knowledge about the changes taking place and what effects they have. But that's a really great point that um, gathering these stories for one of those purposes like anti-displacement or improving air quality or improving um, green space or access is really important too. Thank you once again. I'd like to thank Lighting, um, Savannah, and Morgan for their presentations today. Thank you.